Hey, B-Siders. Welcome to another episode of Bravo for the B-Side. Uh, this week, after last week's complete crap fest, and I can only describe it as just a a bucket of shit. Raging garbage fire. Yeah. Um, needed something that was good. So we had to go with a known good. <laughs> Yep, so we picked a movie that's been on your all-time favorite list for a long time. Yep. And since I've seen it, I've also grown to love it quite a lot. All right. It's wonderful. It is. And we are going to uh, have a polar opposite of last week. We're going to jump into this and talk about some story filmmaking goodness at its finest. Tone, symbolism, scenery, color, shots, they just do everything right. Yep, they do. Are we ready? Let's do it. All right. Welcome to Bravo for the B-Side. I'm Danny. And I'm Jim. And this week... We're coming at you with a movie that Jim holds close to his heart. This is my all-time favorite movie. Absolutely number one. No questions. Yeah, and you've said that since we met. I know. Yeah, so why don't you tell us about it? Well, this week we are diving into Local Hero. This is an excellent movie. It's uh, from 1983. Directed, direct, directed, directed. Oh my you God. got this. I do. By Bill Forsyth. Produced by David Putnam, starring uh, Peter Riegert, Dennis Lawson, Burt Lancaster, and Peter Capaldi. That's right, folks. Doctor Who. Uh, this was rated PG. It had a uh, 2,551,000 2, pound budget, which at the time came out to about $3.8 million. The uh, logline for this is a beautiful coastline, an oil company wants to develop it. A poor beach bum wants to live on it, and a real live mermaid wants to save it. Only one will get their way. No. <laughs> <laughs> nope. No. No. Uh, this is a UK film shot in Scotland, uh, a couple couple shots in Texas. Uh, before we get into it, the uh, reason that this is being classified as a B-movie is because David Putnam uh, if you don't know him, is the producer of Chariots of Fire, as well as The Mission, The Killing Fields, Being Human, Memphis Bell, uh, and some others. Chariots of Fire was a wonderful movie. And while he was trying to get Local Hero done, everybody shot him down. While he was fishing for financing, oh, Chariots of Fire started getting some Oscar nominations. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. So guess who got a paycheck? <laughs> to make a yeah. movie and it still wasn't a whole lot um one of the quick things they got burt lancaster but he originally wanted two million dollars oof yeah uh david did that that b movie shuffle and begging <laughs> uh and we got burt so yeah. uh we'll talk more about what's going on with this film uh but this is a wonderful wonderful movie and so much to talk about, but let's tell you what's happening in the film. When it starts up, we open with a highway shot. Uh, we're focus, focused on, a, oh my God, it's going to be one of those. We're focused on a Porsche <laughs> moving down through one of the freeways through a city. And a radio voiceover kindly informs us that we're in Houston. And curiously enough, it's talking about a lot of traffic congestion. So then we cut immediately to the inside of a large business building. It's Knox Oil. And we're watching commercial screening. And it's one of those great, like, 70s-era commercials with the meow, 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 music. <laughs> yeah, telling us all about our company. Yeah, at Knox Oil, we're a family. And yeah. we do things right. Knox Oil, your future, all that kind of stuff. It's wonderful. Uh, lots of executives sitting around the table. Uh, lots of people smoking. Mm -hmm. sign of the times and when the presentation ends we hear some snoring that's coming from mr happer who is burt lancaster uh the ceo and he's fast asleep so the executives just sit there and whisper to each other their their presentations yeah so we need to get 60 miles of coastline 
It's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so they need to put a terminal in Scotland because they've got a pipeline going in the North Atlantic. And uh, they need to buy Verness Bay for no more than $60 million. So that sort of sets the the business limit. Here's the budget. Yeah. So then we cut to McIntyre, uh, who is played by Peter Rieger. And he's walking with his friend Cal saying, I'm a telex man. And I love, I love that because telex, so many of you aren't going to know. <laughs> telex is what a fax was before they called it a fax because it was somewhat different and fax comes from facsimile, mm -hmm. right? So yeah, we get the idea that McIntyre does things through telex machines. He doesn't actually go anywhere to close deals. Right. Okay, so that's, you know, it's a pretty quick but easy setup. Then he's on the phone and <laughs> the person he's talking to is Cal, again, who's standing just outside of his office. Right. And he's looking at him through the window. Yeah. Right. Or through the glass wall. Because they can't just walk five feet. Yeah. They're less than 20 feet apart and they're talking on the phone. So then they're going to get something from a vending machine. McIntyre confesses that he's not even Scottish. He's Hungarian. But when his parents came over, they changed their name to McIntyre because it sounded more American. Right. Yeah. So the companies pegged him to go because they think he's Scottish. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so then uh, he's supposed to meet with Mr. Happer before he goes. Right. And he goes up to the office and Mr. Happer is just talking about a comet. Or actually, this is... Yeah, he doesn't go upstairs. Right. So we cut to Mr. Happer in his office. And he's talking about a comet. We don't really know what this has to do with anything. No. But at least he's not sleeping. Right. <laughs> yeah. And he's uh, talking to someone who I was like, maybe this guy's a consultant. And then I was like, okay, maybe he's a therapist. He's not a very good one. No. <laughs> and, it's, and Mr. Hepper wonders if he should have married. He's pondering his life choices. Um, and we get the gist from the conversation that Mr. Hepper does not like this therapist. No, Moritz is kind of a, an eccentric weirdo. So it's kind of playing on the expanded psychotherapy that was taking place in the late 70s and early yeah. 80s. Um, like if you've seen Silicon Valley, <laughs> um, who uh, starts with a G, the, the guy who's in charge of the like fake Google company. Gavin Belson? Yeah, that guy. Yeah. He has a therapist, a guru that comes and sees him. Oh, right. Well, it, he's not a therapist, though. He's his life coach life his, coach. his aura specialist yeah yeah so this is a this is like a trope that's been going on for a long long time yes it is yeah <laughs> um and happer says that he wants to see mcintyre before he goes to scotland mm -hmm. so mcintyre goes upstairs to talk to happer and um this is after she establishes that like mr happer talks to important people like the prime minister and yeah she's the prince of somewhere or other Please tell your royal highness to hold. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so he goes up and Happer just starts talking to McIntyre about the constellation Virgo. He says, while you're in Scotland, keep an eye on Virgo. Yeah. Well, he starts out with Virgo is well up this time of year. Right. And there's like, you know, silence. Even as you're watching. You're like, huh? <laughs> yeah. So Happer's pretty eccentric. And he unveils a planetarium that just happens to be in his office. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Things start moving, the ceiling goes back, and bam, we're in a planetarium. Yeah, so that he can point out what Virgo looks like. Right. And where it will be in the sky. And it's it's ridiculous. And he's really insistent that he gets regular reports on this constellation. Yeah. And he calls McIntyre Macintosh. Yeah. It's good things we're doing, Macintosh. Yeah. <laughs> so right away. Okay, we've established that, you know, Happer is all business. He doesn't know his employees even when they're right in front of him. And he's, you know, send in McIntyre. Way to go, McIntosh. Yeah. <sighs> you know. So then we cut to uh, Mac is now back down in his office and he's calling a woman who, again, is one of the women who sits just outside of his office. Mm -hmm. So one of his many secretaries slash assistants. Um, and he's asking her out. She says no. And then, bam, we're at his house, and he's making a call to his ex-girlfriend, Trudy. And the chat starts out somewhat civil, and then it really goes south quick. 
Yeah. Yeah. And this is more of an establishing shot, um, not so much of his relationship, but of where he lives. Because this apartment, right. it just speaks of money for the 80s. It's it's pretty big. You can mm-hmm. tell he's in a, in a high rise. And in a high rise, real big apartments are a lot of money. And being an oil executive of some mm-hmm. fashion, um, yeah, you, you can tell the guy's making some bucks. And you can also tell that he believes he's happy in this lifestyle that he lives. Right. But it, we can see the cracks. Well, already, yeah. yeah. But yeah, it's a very materialistic thing. Mm-hmm. Everything in there is nice. And unless you're a child of the 80s, <laughs> right. you're not going to be able to look at that stuff and go, that hi-fi is whoa. Well, it's the you thing know, of, you know, if you make notch. a ton of money, you're you're winning. Yeah. And if you're winning, you, you get the best, most expensive of everything and anything. Mm-hmm. And then you're happy, right? Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so then he's on the plane. Obviously, it's first class. Right. Right. Uh, and he goes to meet someone who's waiting for him in the airport. And this guy's supposed to take him to the laboratory. And it's Pete Capaldi. Who's the guy waiting for him? <laughs> yeah, Danny. Uh, yep, Danny Olson. And oh my gosh, he looks so young in this. He does. He looks like he's 14. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we watched him all through the thick of it and through Doctor Who, and he's got that face, right? Right. Oh, that face. I love it. It's such a character face. It is. And he can do so much. And he does in here. He it's does wonderful. a lot with it. Yeah. So almost unrecognizably young. (laughs) And uh, they go to the laboratory and all the men in the laboratory are ogling this woman who's a highly educated oceanographer. Yes. With like five degrees or something. Yeah. Five degrees and yeah. Something else. Yeah. And a diver. And um, she goes away and then they show Mac their plans for the bay. Which basically they're just going to wipe out the whole village and build a plant. Right. Right. So Danny and Mac decide to go to the town Mm -hmm. so they can talk to the locals. And it's a really long car ride. Yeah. On the way, (laughs) Danny stops the car thinking that they hit something. And it turns out to be a rabbit. And so they put the rabbit looking pretty much intact. It doesn't really look hurt. Right. It's just sitting there. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one of my favorite lines is, you know, Danny's getting all panicky. You know, do you think it's hurt? Is, 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 you know, should we hit it with something heavy? Right. And, and, and Mac looks at him. What do you mean? You already hit him with a two-ton automobile. <laughs> it's really cute. Um, so they put it in the car, and we learn that Pete speaks a lot of languages. Danny. Or, yeah. Yeah, Danny. Peter Capaldi <laughs> as Danny. <laughs> but, not, but not Gallic. Right. Right? Yeah. So he doesn't really quite know where they are because the last few signs were in, were in Gaelic. Yeah. yeah. Um, so they have to stop because the mist has gotten so thick. Yeah. So they stop and they wait for the mist to clear like overnight mm-hmm. and all they have to eat is a chocolate bar. Yeah. Yeah. But... They, they, <laughs> they share that. Yeah. So they, they bond a little bit. Mac tells Danny about his Porsche. He carries a picture of it in his wallet. Yeah. Pulls mm-hmm. a picture out of his wallet. You want to see my Porsche? Right. <laughs> Most people would have a picture of their kids or no. Anything. Right. Right. Even like mom and dad, if you don't have anyone else. <laughs> nope. His yeah. car. Nope. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So they take a nap and wait for the mist to die down. And then when the morning rolls, uh, they get up to uh, Max watch alarm, which is another treat. His watches don't make that sound anymore. They don't. And that was super fancy. It was. I mean, again, that's that's a watch that the average man, nope, not going to have that. Hmm. Um, and as we learn, this thing's got a lot of alarms on it. It really does. It does. Uh, so they get out, uh, stretch, feed the rabbit. As they're doing that, a fighter jet flies overhead out of nowhere. Super loud. Uh, Mac ends up naming the rabbit Trudy after his ex-girlfriend. And I think Danny names it Harry. Yeah, he wants to name it Harry, I yeah. think. So they just kind of agree to each name it their own. And then off they go. And then they arrive in the town, Verness. Uh, The streets are empty because it's like at this time, six o'clock in the morning, probably. Uh, And it's a tiny little coastal town. Mm -hmm. Uh, Streets are empty, save for a dog that is just in their way when they're coming into town. The dog could be anywhere, but he's right there. Mm -hmm. 
So they come up upon a small building. It says hotel. Yep, that's the name of it. Yep, just hotel. says hotel. Uh, they knock, and the hotel keeper opens up an upper window. He's in his robe. You know, <laughs> and he's like, what can I do for you? He's like, we need a room. He's like, well, we don't open. You know, you know it's like, off season or yeah, something. We've 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 got an injured rabbit. Uh, hotel owner goes down and opens up the door. He says, it's never locked. Yeah, <laughs> you know, as a matter of fact thing. <laughs> um, takes him into the kitchen and uh, tells him to make themselves some breakfast. He'll be down later to take, to take care of the formal stuff. So that right there is a nice opening. It's a complete contrast to what we've just seen. Right. You know, offices full of people do this, do this, do this, do this. And this is, you know, eh, oh, you know, we'll deal with it later. He can't be you bothered. Know. Yeah. You know. Funny things like leaving strangers in your kitchen and collecting money from them for your services. Eh, it's not important. It's too early to bother with which, that. Which is, you know, the overlying theme in right. this town, right? So, <laughs> uh, upstairs, he's the uh, hotel keeper is, or owner, whatever you want to call him, calls, he's crawling into bed with his wife, and we have an injured rabbit also. He's making fun of, you know, the guests. <laughs> and then all of a sudden, Mac shows up knocking at the door, and he answers it. Mac holds up his briefcase. He goes, Do you have an adapter? He's like, What? <laughs> my briefcase the lock is electric the battery's dead i need an adapter <laughs> ridiculous <laughs> so he says i'll look into it later on it's lunchtime and it's a bit more formal they're actually in the eating area this time right and uh, mac tells the uh, hotel keeper we need to find a mr erky hart mm -hmm. he breaks it out like that mr erky hart uh, the hotel guy tells him he has an office uh, upstairs next door, mm -hmm. and he'll should be there in a little while. Uh, as they step out of the hotel, they're nearly run down by a man on a very small motorcycle, yeah. just blazing through the town. Uh, a little later, they go into the accountant's office, and it's the hotel keeper, <laughs> Gordon Urquhart, mm -hmm. right? And uh, he is the hotel keeper. He's also the town accountant. And uh, so they tell him they need his help to arrange uh, the deal to purchase basically everything in the town and the surrounding lands. Yeah. Deeds, you know, all this stuff. Um, he tells them to take a day or two to get to know the place while he works on putting things together. Yeah. So when the two guys leave, Mac and Danny, Gordon stands up and dances and sings about how they're going to be filthy rich. Yes. <laughs> and he calls for his wife, Stella. Yes. So that they can celebrate together. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we get the sense that initially he was sort of like, oh, we'll I'll have to talk to people about it and blah, blah, blah. And they yeah. leave and he's like, heck yeah. <laughs> so Mac and Danny go to take a walk along the beach. And I thought this was really interesting. Instead of viewing the beach as it is. Right. Taking in the gorgeous scenery that's around them. Mm-hmm. They're viewing it as it will be once Knox buys it. Right. Mm -hmm. The the service jetty will be here. The storage yeah. tanks will be right over there. And yeah. Yeah. And, and the refinery over there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And they talk about the importance of oil. Yes. So <laughs> then Mac asks Danny if he knows anything about the stars. Danny does not. No. And before I go on, I just want to mention the actor, for, for those of you who know Star Wars. I'm talking about the first three movies, not episodes one, two, and three. Mm -hmm. Star Wars Empire Jedi. Uh, Gordon Urquhart is played by the actor who played Wedge Antilles in all three of those movies. We barely got to see him in Star Wars. He had a true uh, full-face speaking part in Empire when they're on Hoth, and he's in his snowspeeder. And he actually... We got to see him uh, some again in, in Return of the Jedi during the, the end battle. But as all the heroes are returning, they actually gave him a shot walking up with the rest of the big guys, Luke, Leia, Han, and Lando. And he's up and he uh, shakes Chewbacca's hand. Oh, Yeah. That was like, oh, That's nice. Sweet. So anyway, a little bit of trivia for you. Uh, and I just want to, my favorite scene in this movie this sets the humor it's dinner time um they they get their plates brought out and each has a slice of grapefruit on it mm -hmm. and this just gets me every time 
So Danny pokes his grapefruit with a fork and you hear a little, and all of a sudden Mac just goes and covers his eye because <laughs> he got grapefruit juice in his eye. Stings. Yeah. He's like, oh. so he rubs it out and then he picks up his own grapefruit. He's going to squeeze it on something and you hear, and he's like, oh, puts it down. And then he puts his hands over both eyes and he just sits there. And I know it doesn't sound funny saying it, but seeing it play out, this is such the, the simple little things. I mean, it makes me laugh every time. This yeah. is, you know, and this movie's 2019. Full of oh, yeah. That's the thing is we're not going to get into a lot of the humor bits because you got to watch it. It, it has yeah. to unfold on screen. Because also remember this, even though we have, uh, you know, two Americans playing some big parts, this is a British written film so yes. the approach to humor and pacing is is very british it is and of course we love it because it's wonderful it is it's so delightful <laughs> i'm sorry i had to just say the dinner thing no that's okay so um mac has to make a business call to texas the only phone in town i guess <laughs> yeah is a phone box by the jetty Yep. It's the classic red and glass like you see in British shows. Yep. <laughs> um, and I just thought, oh, the days of pay phones. Right? Nobody's, uh, most people are going to be like, what the hell is that all about? I know. <laughs> I grew up next to a pay phone. And people would like do prank calls on it all the time. Yeah. So I would hear it ringing a lot. My bedroom was on the side of the house near the pay phone. <laughs> And a couple of times, actually, the police came to our house because someone had called 911 from the from payphone. The pay oh, nice. And they assumed that because we were kids and we played with it, but we never actually called any, you know. Right. They, they assumed that since we were kids, we were doing that. So we got a lot of talking to about not calling 911 unless it was an emergency. Oh, wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to the American justice system. Evidence? Cha. Right. Well, just because we lived near it. Yeah. Anyway, I digress. Um, <sighs> Mac calls his buddy in Texas, Cal. Yes. And he has to put money in every few words. Like this is a payphone in Scotland. Right. And he's calling America. And this is yeah. 1983 people. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, you think your cell phone plan has a few hiccups. Right. Jesus Christ. He's got a fist full of quarters. No, tens. Oh yeah. Yeah. Dimes. Dimes that he keeps popping in there. <laughs> every 30 seconds. Mm-hmm. And he, he manages to say that the deal might take some time, and then he kind of gives up on the phone call. Yeah. Walks out of the phone booth and nearly gets run over again by Ricky, the motorcycle driver. Yep. <laughs> so after, after that, uh, he just kind of stops and he looks up at the sky, and it's big. It's a beautiful shot out over the ocean. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's just like standing in anywhere in Montana. Even in the city. If you're standing in Helena, you look up, it's just sky yeah you know uh then we cut back to houston so happer is with moritz again and moritz is telling him that next time they they started they need to mix it up they start getting physical hitting tying up happer's not having it sounds like a, like a <laughs> exploratory exploratory <laughs> therapy so anyway happer kicks him out uh <laughs> Moritz is more of a nut than a doctor, but it, he, he he adds to it. It's it's funny. Uh, so Happer tells his secretary to cancel all future appointments, and then we cut back to uh, Vernas, uh Max in his room in bed, and he can hear Gordon and Stella giggling and carrying on. And then we it's the next day. Mac and Danny are on the beach again, and then we see another jet or we another jet fighter flies over, mm -hmm. super loud, followed by yet a second one. Right. They both fly over a hillside, and then we see, you know, a flash of light and a boom, boom. They're yeah. dropping bombs somewhere over the hillside. You know, your first thought is, what? <laughs> and then secondly, well, maybe it is a bombing range. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's something to do with this. Not really. Shh. Spoiler. <laughs> <laughs> so then as they're walking, they see an old man who's just toddling along the beach and he's picking things up and they give him a wave and uh yeah then yeah <laughs> <laughs> then max says uh he wants to go to the church yeah so they they start heading towards the church which is at the far end of the beach 
Right. And we cut to in the church and Gordon is talking to what seems to be the entire community yeah. inside the church. Yeah. And this isn't, uh, this isn't Sunday no. as far as our understanding goes. Right. It's like a town meeting. Yeah. And he seems to want to help them get good money for their properties and everyone seems pretty into it. Right. The people in this town are not like, oh, this terrible oil company coming in to steal our homes. And, you know, they're all like, we're going to be so rich. They're ready to sell. Yeah. I mean, yeah, they're ready to sell. And he's like, <laughs> you know, let me do my thing. Get you right. some good deals. Yeah. Yeah. They're anxious. Yeah. And um, someone runs in to warn them that Danny and Mac are coming. Yeah. <laughs> so they send the priest out yep. to waylay them. From coming into the church and seeing that, like, the whole town is meeting about this. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's cute. And then um, the priest comes out and talks to them. And while Mac and Danny are going to walk away, we see in the background that the whole town is, like, booking it out of the church. Yeah, they're doing that I want to be sneaky kind of run walk thing. Right. In 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 the wide open. Yeah. Mac has his back to the the, the there. He's looking out over the ocean mm -hmm. talking to Danny and Danny's just like Danny can see it. And he's like what <laughs> Not not hinting that he's seeing anything. <laughs> but yeah, it's it's <laughs> it's funny. Um that night at dinner there's a bit of a kerfuffle. Oh, there is. <laughs> because Gordon serves them rabbit stew. Yep. And it's Trudy, the rabbit. And they're upset about it. <laughs> <laughs> they are. Danny storms off. Yeah. Um, Stella comes in and apologizes. It seems like it was a genuine misunderstanding. She's like, we eat rabbit here. Yeah. You know. Well, and Gordon tells him that they, it was injured. <laughs> you know, his leg was broken. It was a clean break. Look at the bones in your plate. You'll see it. <laughs> oh, Jesus. <laughs> okay. Next day. Mm -hmm. We're past the rabbit. Yep. Uh, we are on the jetty and the townsfolk are talking about high end cars. <laughs> Two mm -hmm. guys, which is better? Or a few of them. Uh, Rolls Royce or a Maserati. And they're arguing storage and, you know, you want, where are you going to put your traps? <laughs> yeah. I, I just love it. So then we have two of, of what are basically the elders, mm -hmm. two of the oldest people in the village, standing next to another old fellow, Gideon, who is the boat painter. Every time you see him in here, he's, he's painting. The, he's not painting the fucking boat. No. He's, he's got a little piece of wood on the side of it and he's painting the name yep. on the boat. Through the whole movie, he's painting that name. It's a different name every time. <laughs> So he's, 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 um, this time he's, he's, uh, naming it silver dollar. Right. And so the, the two guys, <laughs> Gideon, are you sure there are two L's in dollar? And the answer's like, yes. And are there are two G's in bugger off. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that little bit just describes almost everybody in, in, in terms of the feel of the town where mm -hmm. everybody's kind of coming from. We still run into a few more, but yeah. There are a lot of really good kind of establishing shots of the character of this town. Yeah. Right. And done in just a few lines, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're very well done. So then, you know, it goes on. We see some shots of the town folk. They're all charming mm -hmm. and funny and cute. And um, we get the sense that Gordon and Stella are also very much in love. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They're, they are each other's world. Yeah. You get that feel. Mm-hmm. Um, we learn through all these shots about the town and the people in it. You know, the fishermen say that they don't eat the lobster that they catch because it's too expensive. Yep. And they marvel that Mac has only one job. Yeah. <laughs> so, Mr. Mac, you have only the one job then. Yeah. And he's like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, and during that conversation, there's a baby sitting with all of them. And Mac asks, who's baby? <laughs> and they all just kind of look at each other. <laughs> Like an alien just landed. I know. Like, hmm? oh, hmm? Baby? <laughs> so, you know, and it leaves you wondering, what the hell? <laughs> you know, and then while you're thinking that, we move on. Yep. Because, Doesn't matter. Yep. Now we're we're on the beach and we're with Danny and he sees Marina, who is the uh, five degree. Oceanographer. Oceanographer, diver, mm -hmm. technician, researcher. Yep. All the names they gave her. Uh, she's walking up onto the beach from from the bay in mm -hmm. scuba gear. Yeah. Right? 
So he spies on her from a ridge. She sees him, says, come on down. So he does. And she tells him that she's been working on a biological profile of the whole Bay Area uh, for for a while. Yeah. Okay. And then we, you know, we're, we're done. We're back in town. Uh, Matt goes to the general store for some toothpaste and shampoo. And this is another, this is what small town life is like. It's smaller than a convenience store. I believe it's the general store and post office. It is, because mm-hmm. most of them are. Yeah, it's everything. <laughs> um, there's only one type of shampoo, one type of toothpaste. And, um, you know, you look around and there's just not a lot of anything. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's it's a tiny little town. They're not going to stock a lot of stuff. So they right. have just, this is what you get, mm-hmm. right? Uh, and then we pop back to the beach. Uh, Marina is telling Danny about how she thinks some kind of biological research station is going to be put in because of all the attention up here. And mm-hmm. you can see that Danny just doesn't have the heart to tell her that's not it at all. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so back at the hotel, this is a really, really sweet moment. You can hear music playing, but I'm not sure if there's music playing in the, you know, in the movie. Right. It's like tonal music. No, it's they're they're it's playing in the throughout the place because remember okay. later, Matt comics everywhere they go downstairs there's music playing. Okay, there's speakers in every room. Yeah, so at the hotel, Matt catches Gordon and Stella just dancing. Slow together. dancing. Yeah, yep. in the dining room, and it's so sweet. Yeah, just in the middle of the day and mm-hmm. all this stuff going on, and they're just dancing. Yeah, it's know, adorable. It, it is. It's awesome. Uh, so at the bar. Gordon is also the bartender. Yes. <laughs> and he does mention he's also the cab driver sometimes, too. And I thought, cab? <laughs> it's literally a 45-second walk from one end of town to the other. <laughs> I feel like it's a part-time job at best. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe he goes from pub operator to cab driver when somebody has too much and they can't walk home. Because nobody's driving in this town. No. no. They all walk except Ricky. Except Ricky. Yeah. Yeah. He's just burning it up. (laughs) And we're starting to see, and I mean, we've seen it before, but we are starting to cement the fact that Gordon is highly, highly intelligent. Oh, he, yeah. He knows what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, He's not some small town bumpkin. No. You know. (laughs) And he knows that making the Knox guys get to know the town and the people in the area is going to drive up. The buying price. Right. Because they're right. going to they're gonna start inadvertently seeing value mm-hmm. in things. And not just that, you know, well, we thought this land was worth this, but it's beautiful, so it looks like that. Not so much that as when uh, you get to know people, right? You get that attachment. Yeah. What, you know, I have, a, I have a baseball card, say, and, you know, the book says it's worth 25 bucks. But to me, it's worth, you know, 5000 because of how I got it or... You know, something mm-hmm. that I have a sentimental attachment to it. Somebody who has a sentimental attachment to that card because they had one one time, right? Right. Or something, they might pay that 5000 They might. Even though it's only worth twenty five. Yeah. They're like, oh, the card's here. I can get it right now. It's in good shape. I don't have to, you know, keep pissing about looking. Mm-hmm. Done. And I've done that with things that I lost as a child, you know, and then. Oh, me too. I'm like, I don't care. You know, I'll I mean, I have it. limits. Like, we go to Comic-Con. <laughs> I see a lot of, of toys that I lost. You know, what 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 our daughter has of my Star Wars toys is barely representative of the cache of treasure <laughs> that I had. And um, I find things, but, you know, like that die cast ship set, you mm-hmm. know, it was like you know, 250 bucks for the, the three of them. Right. And that, no, no, because yeah. I, I bought those with my allowance at, you know, 50 <laughs> cents a fucking week. <laughs> Right. <laughs> when I was a kid, they haven't appreciated in value. No. But so, yeah, that's what he's playing that smart game. Yeah. Yes. And so Gordon and Mac in the bar are talking a little bit about the deal. And they go down to the beach to an old guy who lives there in like a ramshackle it's, thing. It's it's a hut made of pieces of boat and whatever yeah. the fuck else you can imagine. Doesn't have a door, has a, a folding or a, a double open window right? halfway up and you have to climb in and out of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And this beach hermit is named Ben. Mm-hmm. And he's a bit, he's a bit kooky as you might expect. Yeah. But he's also very much in tune with himself. Yes. You know, you know, and they ask Ben almost jokingly, 
how much he thinks the bay is worth. Yeah, while they're having tea. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And he just laughs. That's his answer. <laughs> yeah. Um, then they start talking about constellation and constellations and comets, and a meteor shower starts. Yeah. And Mac is awed. He's never seen one before. Nope. And Gordon's like, eh, it's just a meteor shower. Like, what? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we he, he looks and we see a few mm-hmm. very 80s VFX streaks yeah. of light. And then we cut to Danny in his room at the hotel. And he's in a tub submerged. I'm like, what's going on? Well, you can see that he's, he's t- he pops up, checks his watch. He's timing himself. To see how long he can hold his breath. And yeah. it looks like trying to make it longer each time. Mm-hmm. So <sighs> the next morning they leave the hotel. Uh, and as they step out, Mac puts his arm out. Soccer mom save. Soccer mom arm save. Yeah. Saves Danny from stepping into the street, getting hit by Ricky. Mm-hmm. Who's, you know, coming out of nowhere. Yeah. Um, Danny just right away takes off to the bay. And uh, the phone in the phone box is ringing and someone answers it. One of the, the jetty guys and yeah. calls for Mac. It's for him. And then as Mac gets in the phone booth, it's interesting. Ricky is driving the edge of the jetty, you know, away from him. He's in the shot, but he's, you know, 30, 40 yards away from Mac. Right. Still doing his thing. And uh, Happer's on the phone, wants to know what's going on. Mac tells him about the meteor shower. He's like, where did it come from? He's like, it's the sky. They came down. <laughs> <laughs> what part of the sky? Part of the sky. He's like, the sky. Yeah. <laughs> Happer's ridiculous. Uh, he hangs up the phone and uh, he pushes a button. It's late. You can see the, you know, the darkness through his office windows. Pushes a button on his desk and a wall opens up. Yes. And the first time I saw this movie, I, I told you, I thought, oh, you know, dude's got a, got a little like, he doesn't do lunch. He makes it. He's got a little kitchenette. Yeah. No. It opens to his fucking apartment. The rest yes. of that floor is where he actually lives. Mm-hmm. And so Mr. Happer has this gigantic <laughs> two-story office. Yes. That's also a planetarium. Mm-hmm. And, you know, not like what you put in your kid's room. No. You the whole planetarium machine and everything. A legit planetarium. And then he's got a full penthouse apartment attached yeah. to it. Mm-hmm. So the guy literally lives at work, and that is super commentary for super eighties business, business, business. Right. I love it. Ah, so he goes in there, does his thing. Mac is on the beach. Uh, this time he's not wearing a suit. He's wearing a fisherman sweater. Uh, I don't know if he has the sweater on yet. I think he's just walking around in his shirt and he's got his sleeves rolled up. Maybe. Yeah. Because he doesn't have a suit jacket. Um, and uh, he's walking around. And then uh, we cut to Danny, who's at the bay. Marina shows up. We cut back to Mac. And now he's barefoot, walking through the tide pools. And he bends down, takes off his watch, sets it on a rock. And he's pulling gels and stuff out of the water. And then we are back to... Uh, Danny with Marina and they're looking at seals and (laughs) (laughs) in the distance and she's just enamored with the seals. Mm -hmm. You know how clever they are. Rascals saying that, you know, the salmon fishermen would shoot them on sight because they destroy their nets and everything. She goes like, they know what they're doing. Yeah. And Danny just makes a comment that says, ah, sailors used to think they were mermaids. And she looks at him, gives him this peculiar look and just says, yeah, they were wrong. And that plays in a little later. Right. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we get a, a bunch of other little shots that more build up the character of the town. And that's something this movie does really beautifully it, 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 through little things like the way Mac is dressed throughout the movie. And, right. You know, how far the Ricky, the motorcyclist, is away from him and, you know, how he interacts with the people of the town. Mm-hmm. It increases and builds. Yeah. As the movie goes along. Yeah. It's noticeable. Yeah. It's clearly, you know, very symbolic, but it also is very believable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the general store owner gets a radio signal and is just thrilled to learn that the Russians are coming. 
Yeah, it's very staticky. It sounds you can you can hear it. it sounds kind of Russian. Yeah. But yeah, it's super staticky, like spy radio. Right. You know. Yeah. And she just loses her shit. Yeah. <laughs> She's keyed up. <laughs> and then we see an angry woman dropping off a cheerful looking fellow in a boat. Yeah. She's like giving you know giving him an earful. In Russian. Yeah. Oh, she's yeah, she is having at him. Yeah. Even when she leaves, as the as the boat <laughs> engines rev up and get louder, she gets louder. Yeah. It's and, awesome. And he looks like he doesn't care at all. He's just pleased as Punch to be here. <laughs> and he gets off the boat, and he's clearly familiar with the townsfolk. He's giving people hugs and kisses, and you know everyone seems to like him. And we learn that his name is Victor. Mm-hmm. And Gordon tells him about the deal. So we learn that they're they're in with each other. They're friends. Yeah, they know each other. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're going to be rich. (laughs) Oh, wonderful. Yeah. (laughs) And then, so we have Mac uh, walking along the coast. His shoes are still in hand. Uh, And then he walks up to a hillside, sits in the grass, and he's looking out over the ocean. And then, this is one of those great moments, we cut Mm -hmm. back to the tide pool, we see his watch on the rock being drowned as the waves washing over it, and an alarm is going off. Yes. And it's all just sort of, Mm -hmm. you know. So, yeah, this thing that was really important to him, because he checks it, like, ACD. Yeah. ACD. OCD. Jesus Christ. OCD style. Yeah. Throughout the film, and well, the beep, 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 going, oh, it's conference time, beep, 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 oh, it's got to make the business call time, beep, beep, just, oh, finally that fucking thing's gone. Mm-hmm. Um, we cut to uh, Danny, who's getting a little fresh with Marina, trying to impress her with some languages and stuff, ends up kissing her knee down her foot, or her leg, and then when she gets to her foot, you see she's got webbed feet. Yeah. And he's like, huh? And then we're done. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we're back to Mac. Yeah. Who is back at the bar with his arms just like chock full of shells. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And that is all he's concerned about right now Yep, are the shells. And he sees the Russian, Victor, and Gordon doing some paperwork. Yeah. And Victor like tells him what some of the shells are. Yeah. Oh, this one is, this one is, this is very good to have. Yeah. (laughs) Mr. Mac. Yeah. You know. And it's funny because this this establishes Gordon as well. Because Gordon is like, you know, look, I've taken your stuff and I moved it over here and the mm-hmm. yield and this and that. And they've got Stun's paper and Victor's just signing. Yep. And Gordon's like, you know, maybe you should get in, you know, think about real estate. Once this deal closes, I'll be fairly liquid. Right. You know? Oh, Gordon, you know who I am. I'm a cash man. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. So he's, he's Victor's accountant, basically. Yeah. Handles. The, yeah. Gordon. And that really sets up Gordon. The town, you know, trusts him. Mm-hmm. But now this guy trusts him to handle his basically his future. Right. Because back then, you weren't making investments with your money like this in Russia. These no. people, right, ship captains and stuff, the working class did not have access to this level of financial investment. So he, what does he do? He pops off in Scotland for a day or two and mm-hmm. has his money managed. Yep. <laughs> This movie's so soothing and simple to the point where at this point I even, I was like, I almost resent having to take notes instead of just enjoying it. It was hard. As many times as I've seen this movie, (laughs) I could have done the notes without watching the movie. Yeah. Right. And I was tempted to. Yeah. But. Anyway. uh, It is distracting. (laughs) It is. Having to do that because it is a very tonal movie. It is. Mm Mm-hmm. And Danny comes in and Max upstairs cleaning his shells. And they chat a little bit. And Mac, this is where you learn that he, you know, wasn't super, you know, 100% absorbed in his shells. He noticed, you know, Victor and they talked. And so he asked Danny if Russian is one of his languages. And then he's like, yeah, that's one of mine. Yeah. And that was it. (laughs) Yeah. So uh, it's the next day evening uh, and they're having a Kaylee. And that's kind of why Victor's there. He knows when the Kaylee is and they also get his money taken care of. So we, we see what a typical Kaylee is, which is a Irish, Scottish, it's a Celtic village gathering of music and celebration. So it's just this, you know, tiny village. There's people dancing. There's a band playing. Poor Danny's being salted by the only punk rock girl in town <laughs> for a dance. Um, you see an old she's man. She's very into him. Oh, she is. Well, <laughs> he's different. Yeah. <laughs> 
Uh, there's an old man in the corner getting his tie fixed. Gordon and Mac are in the kitchen. And this is where we see Mac is wearing a suit jacket, but now he's wearing his fishing sweater. Yeah. Right. Um, oh, it was a, a regular shirt with a sweater vest, business sweater vest. That's what he was wearing, collecting shells. Mm, mm-hmm. Yeah. But this, yeah, this is a full on knotted fisherman sweater. <laughs> and so they're discussing the deal. And then Victor takes the stage and it's wonderful because he's singing and he's so heart soaked over the shop, the, the general store woman. Yeah. They're just locking eyes and they cut to her and she's so like she's from the fifties, you know, watching any number of swooners singing. She's just oh, holding his jacket <laughs> all up in her face. And it's just wonderful. It's adorable. It really is. And then <laughs> he's belting out his song. And, and then we get to two old men in the corner and it's great. They're just, you know, these are the elder guys. Right. And they're giving distasteful looks at this old woman who's just swooning over Victor. And she's <laughs> looking at him and they're just like, oh, giving her the stink eye, something fierce. Yeah. And then we see them, uh, there's, you know, there are people dancing and stuff. And then we're back to the two old men who are now standing and getting drinks and they're talking money. Um, You know, it, it's... And they're just very passive about it. And then the music picks up. And I just love it. These two old codgers are just all of a sudden rocking in place. Their <laughs> like version they, of dancing. Well, yeah. They, like they can't help it. It's just yeah. like automatic. As soon as, as it, bam, 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 And they just start. mid seconds, <laughs> You know. <laughs> yeah. Um, And we have Gordon and Mac talking again. And Gordon is, seems to be like pushing Mac to talk about this deal now. Right. Wants to get. Wants to get things settled. Yeah. Right. And Max is like, oh, whatever. Yeah. Whatever you want, Gordon. Yeah. He can't be bothered. And, and the takeaway shots from all this are great. They are short, they're simple, and they're giving us a clear look at the people involved. These mm-hmm. people are, are not attached to their lives, not attached to this town. There isn't a single person <laughs> we've seen that has any doubts. They want money in hand mm-hmm. and to get the hell out of there. Yeah. Which um, plays up in just a minute. Um, uh, As Gordon gets up there and and plays the accordion for a waltz, Stella asks Mac to dance. And they have a nice little, you know, little dance. Uh, Danny makes his escape from the punk rock girl. And then we see Ben, who was invited to the Cayley. Mm -hmm. He's just in the food room all by himself, shuffing sandwiches and shit in his pockets, (laughs) taking a bite of things. More sandwich over here. Some puffy things over here and you know yeah he's <laughs> just doing his thing yep um so mac and victor are chatting about the deal and you know we see kind of victor's point of view on it mm-hmm. and the band's playing danny goes down to the water to meet his lady love the diver yes <laughs> and he feels bad about lying to her about the marine lab um well when he meets her he's pacing yeah. Right? Near the jetty. All of a sudden we hear, shh, like a splash. Turns around and she's there. Yeah. Like, bam, right there. Mm-hmm. You know, not wet. No. Just right there. Yeah. Yeah. And the Northern Lights interrupt their conversation. Yeah. Meanwhile, Max sees the Northern Lights <laughs> and decides that he needs to call Happer right away, despite the fact that he's a little bit lit. Oh, he's super lit. Yeah. <laughs> and he's describing them as best as he can. Yeah. Not super successfully. And red and wait, oh wait, that's the phone box. Oh my god. <laughs> yeah. And however, Happer gets distracted by the the therapist. <laughs> Who's outside on his windows. Right, hanging up a vulgar message. Yeah. <laughs> Climbing gear and everything. Hanging right. off the side of the building. <laughs> mm-hmm. And shouting at him through the window. Yep. <laughs> so he's pissed. He sets down the phone and he goes to yell at him. And when he comes back, um, he's missed the end of Max's excited diatribe. Yeah, the call got yeah hit, uh, dropped. But you know, <laughs> <laughs> back at the bar, we have this really interesting conversation between Mac and Gordon. Yeah, where as Gordon's been pushing Mac to talk about this deal all night, mm-hmm. um, Max obviously not been fully with it. No. And he tells Gordon, and he's a little drunk, but, you know, he he's being honest. Yeah. Right? He tells Gordon that he wants to swap lives with him. Yeah. I feel like you're being really generous by, by minimizing how drunk these guys are. 
Okay. They're they're each a half a bottle from comatose. That's they're fair. a quarter bottle from not being able to move <laughs> or walk. <laughs> they're well into it. And yeah, so he wants to switch lives with him. Yeah. And Gordon's first question is, Well, what about Stella? <laughs> <laughs> and Max's like, Well, I love her. Obviously, she would stay with me. Right? <laughs> I'd make a good Gordon, Gordon. I love that. I'll make a good Gordon, Gordon. <laughs> <laughs> and Gordon goes, sure, Mac. Yeah. <laughs> You're a good friend, Gordon. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the next day, uh, we have Mac sitting outside talking with Victor. They're talking cars, insurance, down systems, kind of connecting that um, sameness right? right? This guy's a fishing boat captain, but he has a hi-fi at home quad and, you know, this mm -hmm. and that. Uh, talking insurance on cars. Uh, they exchange cards with their contact information, addresses, and phone numbers. Mm -hmm. And then Gordon shows up saying there's a problem. Apparently the beach that Ben has been living on is actually Ben's beach. Literally. Yeah. He owns all of it. Yeah. The entire beach and some miles inland, apparently. Like four miles. Yeah, it was some sort of family inheritance thing. Um, and then Mac is told that Happer had called and said he's on the way. So he's like, son of a bitch. Okay, so they're off to talk to Ben, and it's funny because as they're doing all this moving about, we hear Ricky, and he's hundreds of yards away mm -hmm. in the hills right behind the town, and you see him, right? You know, so he's not even near Mac now nope. at this juncture. Um, and then as they're walking along, they find out Ben's last name is Knox. Interesting. Right. They never make a connection. I'm just going to say that. Right. Right. But his name is Knox. Uh, we learn, as they're talking to Ben, it's been his family for 400 years. Some sort of, one of his family helped a uh, minor nobility out of a problem. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, they try to explain to him that somebody wants the beach. Ben says he's still working and it's his living. And we see that it's another day. And then they're back at Ben's. Mac is trying to sell Ben on another beach. He's got postcards and stuff. And Ben's not right. interested. Um, a lot of back and forth. And Ben's just isn't. It's not important to him. Right. You don't want your fucking money. No. You know. So they uh, later, they're at the hotel giving him dinner. After dinner, he strolls home with no deal made. But as he walks away, the townsfolk are like, you know, Ben, can we have a word with you? And, yeah. you know, Gordon's like, maybe we should walk him home. Yeah. You know, so they do. And it's great. Um, ben has a chance to tell them that 200 years ago the beach supported 300 people because they're like you know if you sell the beach there'd be a lot of jobs and stuff and he goes well it's always been that way um they you know extracted um uh, oil from the the kelp and okay. stuff that washed up you know and, and stuff uh and then i love it he just without even looking at him he's like if you got the beach it would be goodbye beach forever wouldn't it mm -hmm. so he he sees it very differently then the townsfolk see the town and their homes right. and stuff. And then Gordon sees the townsfolk. <laughs> it's a very, <laughs> very 30s, 40s, sinister moment style. <laughs> you can see them coming down with set of lit torches. They've got their flashlights. Right. Weaving down the hill behind the church. And Gordon's like, oh, they've taken the church road. And I remember first, yeah, I still feel it. But the first time I'm like, oh, Jesus Christ, this is going to get grim, isn't it? <laughs> oh, my God. So then suddenly there's a light in the sky and it's a helicopter. It's Happer. So he lands. They tell him what's going on. And Happer wants to talk to Ben. Saved by the helicopter. Yeah, because everyone's like, what? So, right. You know. It's almost like a, you know, torches and pitchforks. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so um, Happer's talking to Ben for a mm -hmm. really long time. Right. And he finally exits Ben's shack after, you know, everyone is just outside waiting forever. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mac runs to talk to him, and Happer has changed his mind about the refinery. Yeah. He says, I don't think that's the thing to do here. And Danny brings up the marine lab idea mm -hmm. that he's been chatting with his lady love about. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and Happer loves it. Well, because he wants to put in uh, a, a telescope. Yeah, a giant telescope and planetarium. Mm -hmm. uh, and he wants to do research there because yeah. of, the, the, of the sky. You know, he's got 30, 40 uncharted objects already. Yeah. You know, <laughs> yeah. Happer's really excited about the celestial yeah. possibilities. Yeah. So the 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 sea part of it just oh yeah, yeah. you know, sea sure. and sky sea or something sky. about yeah, yeah sea and sky, sea right. and sky. 
So he just tells Mac, and he's so dismissive. Right. Tells Mac right away, now take the helicopter, go to Aberdeen and tell them to change the plans, then go back to Houston and get to work on it. Yeah. Which which also, I made it sound like get to work on the change in plans and make this shit happen too. Right. Yeah. And <laughs> right. Mac is not keen to leave. No. He's not. You can see it. He's just like. <sighs> he's just deflated. He doesn't want to leave this place. Right. And uh, without pacing out the, the the back end of it, um, in the end, everyone still gets their money. Happer is still buying everything. Right. Right. And everyone's still going to get their money. But mm-hmm. anyone who stays can also have a job at one of these new industries he's putting right. in. Right. Right. And I don't know what the deal with Ben is. Maybe Ben's not losing his beach. They might. He might let him build on it. But you would right. get the feeling he's still going to live there. Yeah. And and be a part of all this. Mm-hmm. Have access to it, which, you know, would be awesome. Yeah. So it's kind of, a, you know, still a happy ending in the end. But then we get back to Houston and Matt gets home, walks into his, and you you had noted, very artificially bright yeah. apartment. It The light from watching this whole movie in and out of the buildings were in Inverness mm-hmm. and then the countryside. It's all kind of a single type of light that you get used to. Very all warm sudden, and natural. Yeah. He walks into his apartment. And you're like, Ugh. yeah, <laughs> it's, Oh, I don't like mm-hmm. this. Um, gets to his counter, empties his pockets of shells. He uh, pins up some photos on the cork board. Uh, and he goes to the balcony, opens it up and there's nothing but city sounds, sirens in the distance, cars driving by regular city stuff. And no right? stars, no stars, hazy, Mm-hmm. sky and you can't see because of all the lights from the city anyway yeah right and so it kind of fades a little bit and then we fade into the jetty so we're we're out uh we have a look at the at verness from the ocean from the right. bay and we see the phone box on the jetty and it starts ringing and there's nobody in town to answer it so i'm guessing this is a little while later yeah you know he's homesick almost well, I feel like this movie ends happily for everyone but Mac. And I always thought, every time I've watched it, including the first time, that it was him calling the phone booth at the yeah. end. Yeah. 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 It's, yeah. You, you know that it's him calling. <laughs> but there's nobody there. Right. And that's the curious thing mm-hmm. is, and then the credits roll. So we're done. And we have some awesome music by Mark Knopfler. I'm going to get into that in a minute. Um, The, the thing... With the, that was the most striking scene of, of the movie is that solely empty, you know, town yeah. with that phone box. He doesn't have anybody's information. No. Right? He was so enamored with it, but life goes on. Yeah. See, they have found new lives. And they couldn't get out of there fast enough. Right. Because when they're talking with Victor, at, or when he's talking with Victor at the Cayle, mm-hmm. Victor tells him, you know, you can't eat scenery. Right. You know, you're doing these pay- people a huge favor. Their lives are hard. Yeah, because Mac is like, God damn, I don't want to run them out of this. This is fucking beautiful. I want to live like this, right? Yeah. You know, which is how we end up with him. I'll make a good Gordon, Gordon. Mm-hmm. You know, but Victor gets it. Yeah. He's like, dude, you got oodles of money, man. You don't know what it's like for these people to eck out a living in yeah. this tiny fucking town. Uh, how many days ride from anywhere else in a car mm-hmm. on a twisty cattle road swallowed by fog? Yeah. I mean, you saw their general store. Not only can they not afford to stock a bunch of shit, but you know that people aren't buying a bunch of shit. <laughs> yeah, it's very romantic in theory. And it it's is. a lovely place to visit. Right? It is. It is. And here's the thing. So all these years later, I'm going to talk about the music for a minute because I have something to say about this. <laughs> So for those of you who don't know who Mark Knopfler is, Mark Knopfler is one of the lead men in Dire Straits. Mm-hmm. Okay. So if you know rock music, you know, dun, 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 um, you know what's going on. But Mark Knopfler had been do, wanting to do these beautiful instrumental compositions for a long, and he did a lot of movies, little, either contributed to or scored. And he scored the hell out of this one. And there's a series of music. I call it the theme music. So we don't hear it in the beginning, but they play it during the Kaylee. Yeah. And there's there's three different versions of it on the soundtrack. Yes, I own the soundtrack because it <laughs> fucking rocks. And I went to Ireland in 2005, and I listened to the 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 one version of that 
that theme, it's called Wild Theme, on my iPod on repeat the entire time I was there. Every day, every night. Because it is so beautiful. It just, there's, I can't describe it, but it's, it's an awesome piece of music. But the reason I did it is because I wanted to associate, I mean, this was in Scotland, but where I went to in Ireland was an equally tiny town mm-hmm. called Bray. Only they have a big tourist thing going, but I went off season. So there was fucking nobody there. <laughs> <laughs> and let me tell you, I meet, I, I got this movie after my visit more than I ever did before. And I had been watching it for 20 years almost, right? There is just something about being away from everything into this tiny little town. People don't give a shit. I met some of the most fascinating people that I wouldn't have thought to make up for a book. Right? <laughs> the, the picture of the old man I have who, mm-hmm. who his whole life, his wife and him had gone down. They owned a shop uh, along the, the, the beach. And they went out to the beach and had lunch every day. She passed. And 12 years later, he still goes out every day and has lunch with her. Yeah. That about fucking did me in. <laughs> Honestly, I was just like, Jesus Christ. Are you, I couldn't have made that up. That is so beautiful. It is. When I was out walking, those two guys I ran across, let me take pictures of them. And then I ended up digging fucking fence hole posts or fence post holes with them on this path because they let me take pictures. Oh, well, I gave them money for drinks too. But, <laughs> <laughs> you know. But yeah, they kicked back and I was just digging holes. You know, that's the kind of shit. You don't get that a lot around here. No. And I'm not saying there's not, place, there's not places in America where you can't. But when we leave our homes and go somewhere, right? Mm-hmm. We don't necessarily look for this kind of stuff 50 miles from town. Right. In the middle of nowhere. When you go to a different country... You kind of like get thrown into it. You're either going to the cities or you're going to the country. Cities have their own stories, but country is what this was all about. Yeah. It's that little hometown thing. So, yeah, I got that whole thing because I did meet some people. I'll wrap this up quick. And I had dinner with them the last few nights. And on my last night, they threw me an Irish funeral, which is basically saying no bullshit. Don't, don't, let's not trade phone numbers, emails, addresses, anything. You're going to fucking go. And that's it. It's like you died. And that's what they used to do during the, um, the potato famine. When people would leave to America, they're like, we know you're never fucking coming back. Yeah. You know, and unless we go there, we're never going to see you. So effectively you, you, you die the minute you step on that boat. Mm -hmm. And that's how they treat it. And it was wonderful and fun and touching, but yeah, I, I have no idea where the fuck they are, if they're Steve, you know, even in town. And I don't even know if they remember me, you know. But it is what it is. It is. It is. But that's where I really understood that ending even more. Like, God damn. Mm-hmm. Poor guy. Yeah. He can't even go back to the town to try and find somebody. He's not going to be there. Fucking gone. Yeah. Oh. The thing I love about this movie is the simple storytelling mm-hmm. in it. And this is something, folks, I I think we have lost because we've seen so many movies, you know, and not like, you know, the just B movies, but like the tentpole movies and stuff. Too much story actually sucks. It's a very complex tapestry. It is. Everyone that we've talked to is like, well, this is a great A story, but what's the B story? What's the C story? Well, no, wait a minute. I can understand the B story underlying little thing like in here danny and and marina Mm -hmm. building a relationship right that's that's the b story okay c story is is ben and what he represents right i get that right but so many movies out there try to layer so much shit that we have a d e f g h and i story and it doesn't make a movie interesting it doesn't make it fuller it fucks it up i think this is a masterpiece because it's very simple Mm -hmm. the 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 points that they make the dialogue is is not you know uh, wasteful no everything in this movie maximizes every second of screen time sound dialogue music everything and not a second more than is necessary right and i don't know is that a is that a a british thing 
I mean, in a way, it does see, kind of seem to be a lot of the British stuff that we've seen does yeah. that. Well, that's why we like British TV more. <laughs> if, <laughs> if I could get straight actual BBC and Sky without having to pay for anything, I would love it. Right. You know, that's why we like Thick of It and IT Crowd. I mean, IT Crowd is a super sitcom, you know. Right. Kind Detectorists. Of thing. Detectorists. Oh, Jesus Christ. There's a perfect example. Oh, that's a beautiful <laughs> show. You know, um, the so you know like for example our our series right we've mm-hmm. had people say well what's the c and d story even like well wait a minute this is a serial from one episode to the next it's this just long ongoing thing about the main character the b stories are the things that happen in the periphery in each episode right while this main thing is going on we don't need to layer a bunch of shit we don't you know i feel like it's already complex enough as it is it is sherlock holmes let's use his for an example Okay, the Sherlock's, Sherlock, oh my God, the Sherlock Holmes stories are laid out simply. They are. Right? He is this super sleuth. Yes. But we don't have, he's got to find this, which attaches to this, which attaches to this, and this is going on, and then he uncovers this, and this direct misdirects him, and then this whole thing is, is introduced and wrapped up in the middle. Right? right. And... And everyone bases their shit off of Sherlock Holmes on, on in terms of how to put, you know, this this mystery together and make it engaging. Yeah. You know, and I just think I think too much when you're writing your scripts, folks, don't try to impress people with how much shit you can layer into it, mm-hmm. because then it just becomes nothing and you don't spend enough time on anything to make it valuable. Right. Right. And I know there's even people out there who argue, but you know, fuck you. That's, I'm not, you know, there's a reason I'm not selling my shit to you. There's a reason <laughs> that we are not working with you to develop any of this stuff. It's, it just keep it simple. Mm-hmm. You know, write your entire script. I, I would suggest this, write it entirely with an A-line story. Then, cause you got to go back and rip that shit apart anyway. Then see where you can introduce the B story. What's interesting. Right. Okay. Now, in the A story, you might have things that support, mm-hmm. you know, like, okay, well, this is doing this and it's going to support that. Okay, we'll flesh that out and make it a B story. Right. In there. Or, but, yeah, or as I've been writing, this, this side character has become really, really interesting. Yeah. Right? This side character needs a little bit of a story. Yeah. What's he doing on his off time? Right. Let's find out. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and it can be comical it can be you know whimsical it can be serious you know whatever you know it it can fold in and contribute Mm -hmm. i think but yeah as far as the simple story because all of the layering is done visually yes in little shots i know that's what you want to yeah poke on so go for it so something that has changed significantly over time in filmmaking is the use of symbolism Mm mm-hmm Right. This movie does it in such a beautiful way. And, you know, the the direct correlation between Max's attachment to the town and the distance of, you know, how far away Ricky is from him. Right. Right. As he gets more attached, those really close calls stop happening. And Ricky's right. further and further away. Yeah. He falls into the rhythm. Mm hmm. Yeah. Um, his clothing throughout the movie evolves as he becomes more attached to the town. Right. Right. He starts off very businesslike and he's crisp and, you know, and by the <laughs> end, you know, before he ends up having to go home, he's, you know, he's slumming it in a fisherman sweater at the dance. Stella tells him to take off his suit jacket. Yeah. And he's just chilling literally in the fisherman sweater and some, you know, some jeans and, you know, him leaving his watch in the tide pool and it and the sky, yeah. right? Which initially is introduced as this sort of weird eccentric thing that you're like, why is this a thing? Right. It kind of becomes, you know, a symbolism of of what you know, Max. What's the word? You know, his wonder mm-hmm. for this lifestyle. Yeah. Right. It's directly co- like how attached he gets to the sky. Yeah. Because at first he's like, oh, whatever. <laughs> and then he's looking at it more and more and more. Well, yeah, that one longing look when he steps out of the phone booth that yeah. first time, you know, and you just, again, in the city, you just don't see the sky like that. Right. And we get the sense that that's all he's known. 
Right. Born and bred in the city, you know, mm-hmm. like, like a lot of us. And, uh, yeah, I had something in my mind. <laughs> it's gone again. I'm sorry. <laughs> Damn it. Um, oh, uh, as a, a juxtaposition of lifestyles is when Happer comes back at the end and he sees McIntyre on the beach. At first he thinks Danny is McIntyre. Right. So that's, you know, Happer doesn't have a fucking clue. <laughs> and then he's like, I'm not McIntyre. Well, where is he? And he, you know, I'm McIntyre. And he turns and looks and he's like, Ugh. he gives that look like, right. oh, Ooh. like somebody just handed him a turd. Right. Like he, he assumes that he's one of the, the, the town folk. Yeah. And then he tells him, go get cleaned up. Right. Like a parent. Mm-hmm. Go get cleaned up. Yeah. That's, you know, and I'm thinking, don't fucking see anything wrong with him. <laughs> it's not like he's, you know, got grizzle in a big giant beard and he's right? unwashed and stuff. I mean, yeah. Oh, but yeah, that that right. that's the symbolism puts it right there together at the end for us too. And and so symbolism can be a powerful tool in filmmaking. Yeah. And I find that nowadays it's either like so artsy and overdone that it is. Eh. Yeah. Well, like I said, you'll, they'll cut to a scene and people r- will review a movie or mm-hmm. talk about it and say, oh, and that shot of so-and-so, man, that was such a statement on whatever it's supposed to be a statement on. Right. And almost all the time, it has nothing to do with the fucking movie anyway. Well, you know, that's really interesting because it's, it's either like art scene overdone or it's accidental. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I remember hearing it was maybe an interview with someone. Where they're like, you know, if someone comes up to you and says, oh, I really love your metaphor of such and such in the movie. Yeah. You know, your answer should be, yep, that's what I intended it to be. Or you caught that, did you? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Roll with it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm glad you caught that. Yeah. Well, especially because, I mean, you know, to be fair, this whole business is bullshit. It's, it's the art of bullshitting. Right. You can't call up a producer and say, I've got this great fucking script, talk him into it and then have nothing. Right. But you got to kind of you got to kind of play, you know, when when the card accidentally falls on your side of the table, you got to play that bitch for everything it's worth. Right. Never show your hand. I have no idea what you're fucking talking about. (laughs) I didn't. It's my movie and I didn't even see it. That'll put you out of work quick. Right. (laughs) You know, it will. Yeah. People don't like to think that you've accidentally done things well. No. (laughs) That's that's not how you get a paycheck from anybody. (laughs) Right. But how it's done in this movie is obviously very intentional. Yeah. Right? I feel like if we went to the director and, you know, talked to him about the symbolism of this movie, he'd be like, yeah, duh. Yeah. (laughs) Well, because it is. That's the beauty of it because the storytelling is so simple. Mm-hmm. And he tells the story through the the establishing shots, Ricky, you know, the the morphing of people, and st- you know, just the relationships. It it's all like I said, none of it's wasted, right? And none of it's like super in your face. It's just this is the whole canvas, yeah. You know, and I just want to say, you know, this movie's not without some little oopsies, <laughs> like the one I, I pointed out to you because we just happened to be pausing for that scene and then mm-hmm. we got back to it. Um. <laughs> When they're talking by the dunes, by the church, trying to figure out what the hell's going on. If you look, folks, in the upper left-hand corner, this is during the, the talk with, with Ben, right? Happer's in there. Yeah. And everyone's like, well, I don't know what's going on. We're like, Are we not going to get our money? Ah. If you look in the upper left-hand corner of the screen, it's very small and quick. You'll see somebody run into shot and then behind a dune. Yeah. It's one of the, it's one of the production crew. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> whoops you know little things like that happen they do you know and it's funny in some things like we talked about game of thrones right right that shit's inexcusable for that amount of fucking money that they're, <laughs> they're asking from the network that they're paying the actors and the crew and the the fucking money these guys are making to get this shit done right Oof. yeah water bottles and starbucks cups no that, that's not whimsical and cute that's no. that's stupid in something like this, it didn't detract from the movie. I didn't immediately think, oh, Jesus. Because <laughs> we could do 50, 60 episodes easily. Yeah. On just a couple of our favorite movies talking about all the shit that's not supposed to be in there. I could know? spend 
easily 60 hours just talking about fear and loathing. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> but here's the thing. It works. It does. <laughs> you know, so yeah, little screw ups like that aren't a big deal. No, you know, and that, that's tells the power of the storytelling behind this. Um, one of the things that I found researching, you know, the facts and figures of this is I don't commit this shit to memory. It's a good movie. I don't need to fucking know the budget. Well, I do now because <laughs> we have this podcast. Um, but apparently this year, or it's supposed to be sometime this year or early 2020, uh, this is getting added to the Criterion Collection. Kudos. Yeah. And it's go they're going to uh, remaster it and release it on uh, Blu-ray. And you're going to be first in line. Well, maybe. <laughs> Here's the funny thing, folks. Uh, took me forever to find this thing on DVD. It vanished for the longest time. So it came out in 83. I didn't see it in 83. Right? Because I was only uh, 13 or 14 yeah. when it hit. I saw it a couple years later on HBO. Because that's what how you know it's, it's a B-movie. Because HBO, for any of you who remember when that started up, they had one major movie. And they showed it like four different days in the yeah. month at a specific time. Four o'clock Thursday. That was it. There was no streaming. There was no nothing. And if you fucking missed it, you were, you know... Unless you had a VCR. Yeah. Which pff, back then, not a lot of people did. Yes. It was in 85. Okay. Is when I, I saw it. I happened to be sitting and, you know, this, I was watching the end of whatever was scheduled to be on. And then this rolled on. And I remember watching the first opening shot, right? Yeah. With the, the car. And that, mm -hmm. that's not, a, you know, it's not an eye grabber. No, it's it's pretty standard for this era of movie. Yeah, but then there was something about when when that commercial was over, and I saw Burt Lancaster sleeping in his chair as Happer, <laughs> and the executives whispering like, "What the fuck is going on here?" <laughs> so, and then I was hooked. I was hooked, and I was so sad for the longest time because I couldn't find it anywhere. They didn't have it on VHS at the time. Uh, HBO was you know the only place to go, and when they did get it on v VHS. Uh, I did have it, and of course, you know, I wore it out. It broke. Uh, and then uh, for the longest time, I couldn't get a hold of it. It's like a lot of movies, like uh, Tall Man. You yeah. Had, you had to go like into the, the armpit of Amazon to find me a copy of that. I did, and it was expensive. Or the Tall Guy. Tall Guy. Yeah. Yeah, it was expensive. <laughs> but I love you for it. Aw. <laughs> um, but when I saw this sitting on the shelf in uh, a Hastings in Arizona, like, pfft gonna have it there you go and i've been clutching that dvd ever since and just this week i bought it on itunes yeah <laughs> so we could have it digitally so i didn't have to worry about you know cramming it into the ps4 and you know i'm not gonna buy the fucking tv remote for it so using a controller to control a video folks it's just not my thing mm. you know it, it shouldn't be anybody's thing <laughs> it, it shouldn't it also but, protects your dvd well it does it yeah. does and one day I will run across Mr. Riegert or Mr. Capaldi, and I will have them sign it. Yeah. <laughs> and then it's going to go in the collection with Rocky Horror, and uh, hopefully we'll get some others yeah. signed by these stars. Because that's right, folks. We got Rocky Horror signed. Barry Bostwick. By the man himself, Barry Bostwick. Mm. Yeah. Woo. Okay. Big for us. We don't care. Um. So, yeah, big thing, Criterion Collection. I huge. Think, well, it is. It is huge. And a lot of people think of those as artsy films. This isn't artsy, but God damn if it doesn't show the art of filmmaking and writing. It really does. You know, efficiency. Mm -hmm. Absolute efficiency in storytelling. I think this is, is one of the pinnacles. It should be in, in film schools. It should. You know, and folks, if you can go out there and you can find it. You can rent it off of iTunes. Yeah. Um. Do it. Do yourself a favor. It's not expensive on iTunes either. No. You know, I, well, it's 10 bucks, I think. Yeah. Nine ninety nine to buy it. Um, watch this because it's going to do you a great service. It's going to ex expose you to the core of storytelling and British storytelling. I'll say that mm -hmm. because you'll see a, a, a huge similarity between this from 1983 to things like the Detectorists, yeah. which is the last three and four years. 
um, Thick of It, which was 2003 to 2008 or 12. Because they had some big gaps. There were gaps. Yeah. I mean, British shows, if you folks don't know, can go years between seasons. Yeah. <laughs> so it's kind of frustrating. Um, but a lot of a lot of British storytelling is is so efficient and it yes. just brings you in. You yeah. know, and I'll, I've seen this hundreds of times. Mm-hmm. And it's still, I want to go and watch it again right now. I, I might. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I want to talk about the budget. Okay. This is a pretty big budget. I mean, to be fair. Right? It is. We talked and... about Bubba Hotop having a million dollars. I know. And, and we... that was... <laughs> um, we argued about whether or not this was a B-movie. Right. So, yeah, uh, the struggles he went through to get this, it qualifies as a B-movie because uh, it was made overseas. Um, MGM paid one and a half million dollars for the U.S. rights and it never, it, it didn't hit everywhere. No. Right. And I think they, I forgot to look it up. They made, everyone got their money back and it made a small amount over. This was not, you know. A little bit of profit. Right. A blockbuster. Um I want it for those of you who understand the Criterion Collection. Uh, one of the recent editions was Eraserhead. Yeah. Okay. That motherfucker made no, almost no money. That movie's <laughs> wild. It is, but it it has so much going for it. Mm-hmm. You know, this could be a cult film. I mean, I think it would be fair to call it a cult film. I I I've talked to I don't know how many people who have no idea who this what this movie is. Yeah. Right. Um. And you should. Doesn't matter when you were born. Doesn't mm-hmm. matter what your genre is. Watch this bad boy. Um, see the humor that we can't we we can't explain. Right. It's so simple and visual and quick. It just makes you go. <laughs> you know, it's funny because I was talking to someone the other day about our podcast, and we had just got done watching this and making our notes, mm-hmm. and I was explaining that this was when we were going to cover. And it was, um, it was this guy I was talking to. He was coming through work uh-huh. and he, he was like, what, what, is, that sounds familiar. What is that about? So I sort of explained the plot to him and he was like, oh yeah, I saw that. You know, I haven't really talked to anyone who's seen that. <laughs> I know the pain. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I want to get back to the budget quick. Um, so it was a lot of money for this, this film. Mm-hmm. Okay, a, a, a big portion went to Burt Lancaster. So well, that's the thing. Yeah. Okay, Peter Capaldi got probably uh, British Union rates because he wasn't huge. He wasn't in a position to command, you know, money. Yeah. Right. But the struggles that again had to take place because this was almost never made. Yeah. Which is a shame, you know. Because anyone, even before awards and stuff, Chariots of Fire was like this. It was so brilliantly done. And the story was so magnificently told and efficiently and simply. Right. And you got, you know, a small group of athletes. Things are happening with each of them. But you're not on these wild ass diversions. And I can't imagine how anyone would watch that and not go, oh, yeah, we'll give you some money. The fuck were they thinking? No. Piss (laughs) off. You know, send the guy to raise his own fucking money. You know? Yeah, and and here's the thing, so it was a lot of money, can, can, you know, figuratively, especially back then. I mean, eighty three, you know, uh, three point eight is not not nothing, teeny, right? But he used every bit of it, and uh, especially getting Knopfler to score this movie, which brings out even more of it. If <laughs> if you approach somebody for an investment. Uh, to to produce your thing, you know, to come on board or whatever. And they basically tell you to fuck off. Here's something that you need to know. And I think we've mentioned this before. In this business, that shit cannot last. You can be angry, right? And you can be like, you know what, Kim, I'm not going to see him. Don't ever let pride get in the way. Because if that person does come back to you, if they approach you, even better. Right. But if they end up on a, another list of people and they're like number two or three on that list because of this opportunity, go to them again, folks, this business, people tell you to fuck off consistently. And that same person who told you 10 times 
to get out. Never mind. Forget it. This is crap. I wouldn't touch it. Never mind. Is could be the one who says, I can't wait to fucking do this. I'm going to kill myself working to get you <laughs> money and I'm going to find actors and we're going to make this goddamn thing. Right. Roll with it. Okay. Yeah. This is, this is all about frenemies. <laughs> well, it's a matter of <laughs> right know? person, right time, right place. You know, it's also a matter of don't, you know, don't con don't compromise your core principles. Right. But at the same time, do not casually burn bridges. No, no. That's in a super extreme situation mm -hmm. where, where you would do that. So, yeah, just remember, you know, you might be a little scorched. Yeah. Right? But you're going to walk across that bridge again. You have to. You have to doing this. Um, so, you know, just bear that in mind. You, you got to just, like, suck it up. And, you know, if you know in your heart you got a good story like this, yeah. you come up with something like, God damn, this is tight. Tight. <laughs> <laughs> A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Those are my, those are my, my beats and they flow perfectly like a fucking symphony. Like Mozart himself came down and converted notes to words. Right. And you have other people telling you this too. Yeah. Right. You know, stick with it. Yeah. Don't let someone come in and say, oh, you need like three more layers of story. I'm going to go ahead and say, listen to them, take your notes. Don't do it just because they said it. Right. Stick behind your story because it's your story. Right. Mm -hmm. It's if, 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 if it's a good solid piece like this, it doesn't need <laughs> all this other flair. Right. You know, and again, like I said, write it, write the A story out. Bam. There's page one, page end. So you get to fade out, go back, rip it apart and find, oh, you know, like, like you said, this guy's kind of interesting. <laughs> what's, his, what's his deal? You know, right? so explore it, add that in, give us something that flows back into the story, but doesn't sit on top or underneath it mm -hmm. as its own train. You know, that's, that's what I get from this movie. Other than the fact that it's just so fucking great to watch. I know <laughs> we should put it on when we go back out. I think we will. Right. I think with that, let's wrap it up. Let's wrap it up. You can visit our website at lordsofmisruleproductions.com. That is where you can find every episode of this podcast and links to wherever you get your podcast, mm -hmm. including Pandora now. Yes, they finally, the other day, <laughs> sent an email very casually. Oh, by the way, you're on Pandora. I was yeah. like, sweet. Nice. <laughs> yep, YouTube, iTunes, Google Play Store, Spotify. Stitcher, Stitcher. iHeartRadio, yep. TuneIn, Dweezer, uh, YouTube. Yep. Like I said before, I... I I do throw these bad boys up on YouTube because this is how some people listen to it. And Pandora. And Pandora. Finally. Yes. <laughs> so that's lordsofmisrealproductions.com. Yes. Uh, also, you'll find there a link to our Patreon page. Uh, go ahead and give it a visit. Uh, we got some stuff that um, pay for patrons only. And uh, so like last week's episode was early release. Mm -hmm. uh, for patrons and uh, so we're going to start doing that too putting them up a little bit early uh, so as a patron you'll get to hear all this first yep. and it's right there on the website um, unfortunately you not... cannot search for us on pa on Patreon right uh, because we you know swear we're explicit and uh, so it's uh, patreon.com slash Bravo for the B-side, all one word. Yep. And again, link is on our, our primary website. Uh, yeah, yeah. Check out what we've got. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, become a patron. Yeah. <laughs> Get some inside scoops. Because uh, there's going to be stuff, more stuff that has to do with the, with the podcast. Right. Uh, with uh, our, our short film struggles, uh, some ventures we're going to be moving into. Um relatively soon yeah looking into doing another short film mm -hmm. and uh yeah so you'll have inside scoops to that yep you can also follow us on twitter instagram facebook that's it for now <laughs> yeah those three honestly that's all i have time for people <laughs> <laughs> you, you don't know how much time it takes um, um so yeah twitter instagram those are up there as well and facebook uh, mm -hmm. those links are on our, our lords of miss world productions dot com mm -hmm. page uh, along the top, a uh, couple email links. Yeah. You can send us an email, general uh, questions, 
Uh, you can send us an email, podcast at lordsofmisworldproductions.com. Uh, questions about the podcast or yep. things, you know. Uh, go ahead and do that if you feel it. Yeah. Uh, so if you made a movie that you want, to, want us to talk about, oh, yeah. send us an email. Yeah, send us an email. Contact us through any of these mediums that yeah. we've talked about. Um, if you have something that you've made and you would like us to uh, review it and mm-hmm. talk about what can be learned from it, uh, do it. We'll we'll do it. Uh, we're going to be doing a short film uh, many weeks from now. It's on our list. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, we might do some more in the meantime. But uh, yeah, and, and you know what? Also, we would love to talk to you about your film. Yes. And the struggles, you know, because this movie making bullshit, <laughs> it's, it's not for the faint of heart. It is not. And uh, we know a lot of people who struggle. We do. It's, it's hard. And uh, hearing about you struggling is just going to, you know, bring them up and, uh, yeah. you know, be proud. Tell people, man, this was a bitch, but I got it done. Yep. Yeah. So subscribe to our podcast. Subscribe. Leave uh, us a rating. Leave us a rating, a review review. would be awesome. (laughs) It would. (laughs) We, that's, that's how Apple podcasts works, folks, or iTunes depends on which way you look at it. Sure. Yeah. Uh, all right. B-siders. I think we're going to let you go. Uh, we'll catch you next week. Yeah. I'm Danny. We're going to have something nice. (laughs) And I'm Jim. All right. We'll see you next week. Later, everybody. Bye.